everybody. So today we are going to be talking about a tricky situation that two very large companies right here might be going through right now. So if you don't know, Microsoft's video game department called, I think, Xbox uh, is currently going through an acquisition of Activision, another very large company in the video game media space. Now, both of these companies have a lot of data they probably want to share or integrate. Now, one thing I have learned through doing a few of these myself, acquisitions are tricky. Sometimes you want to uh, lift and shift the data and normalize it so it's one centralized schema. That's not always possible. In fact, I worked on a project once where they did try to do that and it cost about $40 million and it did not succeed. So this approach using graph techniques, some may call this a data fabric, some may call this a data mesh, is one way to not take on the entire monolith all at once and to get business action and business value out of this very early on instead of waiting until the very end. So I have six steps on how to do this and we are going to be modeling it as we go using these two examples. Now, I alluded to this being in that data fabric, data mesh kind of you know space, but for simplicity, I'm going to be calling this hypergraph as we go through it. So mathematically, that's essentially what this is. It's a hypergraph. And if you don't know what a hypergraph is, I will link some things down below if you wanna go and check out the very academic or I think one of them is from AWS, how they define a hypergraph. But think of it as that virtual graph sitting on top of all of the other data sets and all the other databases without having to move them all so they really are connected and hardwired together on the same databases. This is using virtualization. Also wanna mention there are some automated ways to do this mapping. So if you are virtually mapping one field to another field in a certain table, you can do that manually, uh, but there's also some machine learning you can do. I know there are certain tools like Stardog. I know in my uh, recent uh, honest review of their tool, they have a tool that kind of helps you do some of these things. And there's a lot of other tools that'll help you in this space. If you don't want to spend a lot of money, Open Refine is one to go and check out. But automation is maybe a suggested way to do this if you're looking at a large portion of data. But as we'll see in this example, you are going to have some things that are going to have a higher confidence match uh, to others. It's not just a straight string match. So you are still going to have to figure out that context because not everything is clear to outsiders when it comes to this data. That's domain-driven design. It makes sense for your domain and you have your query set up in a certain way, but that doesn't mean it's gonna make sense to others. Now, some might think that a hypergraph is just adding to the technical debt because you're not actually getting rid of those underlying systems. However, I'm going to hopefully prove you wrong today in this video because you can also use something called a strangler pattern where when you are looking at two companies coming together in an acquisition, the MVP data is what you're going to be focusing on first. And then the last is gonna be the long tail. So when we're all done with this hypergraph, you're gonna have some stragglers left over in the individual databases from different domains, or in this case, companies. And that's okay if that domain decides that it is still important to support their business use cases, then they can continue to support it. However, as more and more people are using the data from that hypergraph perspective, the usage statistics on that long tail is going to go down significantly. So that's where that domain has to decide, is this worth keeping or not? And you're going to get a huge bang for your buck starting out because you are starting out with your most valuable use case, which means the most valuable data is being addressed right away. Now, another little trick here is if you work for a company that has many acquisitions, for instance, Microsoft, they have acquired Bethesda just in their video game area, Bethesda and Activision now, um, just within basically a year. Uh, this hypergraph actually serves as a framework for any future acquisitions as well, because again, it's focusing on what is that MVP for that 
that global and that business use case so that any additional data sets or acquisitions or databases will then feed into that. And based on the Strangler pattern, more and more uh, evidence will go into that lower level, that second tier of, of data points that may not be MVP quite yet, but might be as you add more acquisitions. So this is actually something that's gonna help you scale once you do a few acquisitions and have those under your belt. So for Microsoft, they have a very uh, popular video game called Elder Scrolls Online. And we're going with an online multiplayer theme here. And on the other side is Activision, which also has two very large video games that are also online. One is World of Warcraft and the other is Destiny. So our use case here is as technology leaders at maybe one or both of these companies, I want to make sure that I can continue to serve the customer, in this case, the player base, that are using all of these multi massive online platforms to play their video games, which is a very lucrative business. So today we're going to be looking at which servers and what kind of activity they might be seeing from their player base, because that's really what's going to drive the requirements of this project. So in our case, we are really wanting to know uh, how many players are on any given server for any given time so that we can make sure that we can still meet the demands when the players are actually playing across all three of these databases or video games in our case. And this is going to be something that has high impact, high risk, high cost, high revenue, that sort of thing is usually what you want to start with. And that's the beauty of using graph. You don't have to get it all right at the first try and you don't have to get all the use cases addressed in the first try. Graphs are flexible. So if you have another use case down the road that where you need to know the player experience level for some reason across the board, you can add it. So don't worry about the future use cases at this point because you don't have to. The other thing is while we are making all of the nodes and then hyper nodes, I always like to keep track of the source where, where the data came from. So I know, you know, if I'm doing any just a uh, human visual of, of how we're modeling things, they understand where things are coming from. Another key here is we are not messing with the core systems, the original systems that are ETLing this data, the uh, downstream apps and, and analytics that are using this data. That's kind of what the whole data fabric and data mesh is all about is you leave them do the, that. It's their house, their business, right? That's the kind of rule around this. All right, so now we're on to step number three and I'm going to pop up some of the data over here so you can see it as we go. So the first thing you're going to do is identify the uh, data that you had from step two, your MVP, you're going to try to identify that in the data. So you can see that here highlighted in green and orange. So here's why I say that. So green you're going to see is all the same. So they're all the same strings. You would understand what that data, those data points are and that they mean the same thing. Now you need to verify the context is correct. Don't forget that. You need to verify with the domain that owns it if it's actually correct the way you're doing this. So, so now if we look at the orange highlights, those are things that we suspect are the same but we do need to make sure that we go back and ask if we are interpreting this data correctly. So again, you're not gonna just be looking at the, uh, the field name, you're actually gonna be looking at the values in those fields to actually see if you're accurate. And in this case, cluster could mean server cluster. And that's why we are saying these are probably the same based on the field name and the actual value but that's why you also wanna make sure and verify. All right, so what do we do once we have some of this mapping? So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to create a hyper node and a hyper node is kind of like if you clustered all of these together and they mean the same thing, what label would you use? So one way to do this is to use the most common label across the board or you can make a new label that essentially maps to your, your main business use case that you're doing for this. So for instance, if you're looking at cluster versus server, we're going to call this hypercluster a server ID because that's actually what it is. And then what we're going to do is we're going to map those, uh, those fields and their tables to that hyper node. 
Now, are we physically going to pick up the data? No, we're going to be pointing to those areas in those separate databases. But what we're doing here is we're creating a graph, hypergraph, where it is the entry point into all of those different uh, data sources. So you don't have to worry about the mess or what it's called in those other databases, because that's what the hypergraph is meant to help with. So here you're seeing the main data points that we have defined for our use case, where we want to make sure that we can continue to support the servers during the time periods that are the most, the highest volume for a player activity. And you can see when you're creating these hyper nodes, it is a graph. You're going to make relations between the different nodes. So you can see here that server ID is connected to the load of the activity time, right? So the load on a server is going to be different for a five minute match versus a two hour long match. So that's why you're gonna be tracking that. Now, in this case, all of the data we are looking at are IDs. Sometimes you're gonna run into things that are strings. And if that happens to you, really hope and pray that you have a data governance department or a data catalog to help you because those get really tricky. But if you are using a label, there is a strategy you can use to help. Oftentimes a string is connected to a different field or a different table that might have a more controlled ID or a controlled field. So for instance, um, player ID might in one database just have like the player's um, gamer tag if you're on Xbox. Um, and that is largely controlled, but it can change. Um, there's probably an ID behind there somewhere that might be in a separate table that's called like gamer tag ID. So it has all the names and the various interpretations of the name over the years and the core ID that it connects to. So make sure that you're on the lookout for that. All right, so the next step is looking at what I call the commonalities. So these are things outside of the main MVP of your use case. However, they show up in at least two of the data sources or databases or companies uh, that we are looking at. So in this case, and level are two things that show up in some of the databases, but we know they're not really critical to that main MVP. So here's a word of caution. You don't necessarily have to go into this step if you don't want to, but as I said previously, sometimes this is a good framework to continue to add evidence as to when to make a node an MVP node as part of your hypergraph that you wanna to continue to uh, work on through different acquisitions, this is one way to do it. So with this, we're looking at level. For instance, that is not clear what that means. So again, I have to go back to that domain and ask them, what do you mean by this? What do you use this for? Now they are using this as player experience. Now this is really important for matchmaking, very similar to what you would see on dating apps uh, for, a video game, you want to match a player with somebody that is on the same experience level with you because it's a really good piece of information. It's just you don't really need it for this main use case. But if you do decide to go with this, you would still make that hyper node and you would map virtually those those data points to it. And you would still try to map it into the main hypergraph. But again, it's OK if it's not perfect or um, it's not going to make a whole lot of sense to that main use case right now. All right. So that moves on to the next step, which is what do you do with the long tail? So as I said, this is really where the strangler pattern kicks in. It, you need to have a, a time clock on those those commonalities. If you don't see any additional data that's coming in and it's not really being used by any additional MVP use cases, you can take it out of the hypergraph. It's perfectly acceptable to keep it in the main data sources. That's their discipline, their domain. They do what they want, their house, their rules. So it just doesn't need to be in your hypergraph though because it's not gonna be used. Also, a big piece of this entire process is try not to clean the data as you go because you need to maybe give a health assessment report when you're creating your hypergraph to the main domain owners of that data and say, you know, you're calling this level, it's really confusing. Some of your data isn't using the standardized, you know, level uh, rankings that we all wanna use. Could you maybe update it? And we would love to see that, you know, in the next PI product uh, program increment if you're not an agile person. So it's going to add, you know, priority for them if it's going to help a larger business goal, 
i.e. the hypergraph is what that's that's being used for, but it's up to them to clean the data. So make sure you're not trying to clean the data as you go, but definitely consider doing that health assessment report. All right, so now we get to the very last step and that is actually testing. So mapping these things together, that's great then you really do need to work on how do you query um, that hypergraph and you want to make sure that's performance. So you want to do some performance testing on this, but you also want to test with your actual end users. So your business stakeholders, the people that need to be able to monitor the, the server um, activity to make sure that everything is supported, that's the group you want to test. You want to either give them that endpoint so they can do their own queries, or you want to construct that query and uh, give that to them as an endpoint so they can just type in their criteria and then they'll get a response. A um, lot of different graph database tools will allow you to do that, or you could just build your own query and, and connect it on the back end with GraphQL. So, that's how you're going to test. And it might be iterative. You might not have got it right the first time, but this is the smell test. The people who are actually going to be using this data, they don't know all most of the time what other domains have done with the data that they would be interested in. So when they're querying it and they're bringing it in, they're going to find issues. They're going to find things that don't make sense. And that's a good thing. You want to try try to test that and and make it fail as much as possible early on so that before you roll it out you know you, you kind of work out the kinks but this is one really effective way to break into those silos not necessarily breaking them down because when you break them down it's a whole lot more work that doesn't mean you shouldn't try to do that however when you're going through an acquisition and you have business stakeholders breathing down your neck for that data this is one way to help. And I have used this in my past at, at data from acquisition. So I know for a fact it is useful. It is helpful. All right. I want to thank you very much and I'll catch you next time.